To be in the Lord's house tonight, it's a small crowd. Obviously, we, we're losing people, man. I don't know. Maybe they fell out because they're a bunch of drunks. You think that's the case? No, I doubt it. We don't know that. Pray for Mackenzie. She's, she's really battling and not well. I really think her gallbladder might be the problem. And so we just, I think tomorrow morning, she's got a phone visit. We had to wait on that. And uh, hopefully they'll get a, uh, what they call it, a HIDA scan scheduled and get her some, get that, if it'll show what we needed to and get that thing removed after we get Hannah home. And then uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Hannah's going to have surgery. So we got to leave the house at 6.30 a.m. to be there on time. She'll be there at 8 o'clock and then uh, surgery's at 10. You pray it's a three hour, I believe it's a three hour surgery. That's a pretty long uh, wait for me and mama. And uh, what was Mal's, you remember? Was it five? four or five four or five and that one is intense so this one's not near as is is i say it's not near as bad everything's surgery you know surgery wise when hannah could be bad i pray that god will just touch her touch the doctors and uh, touch me and mama as we wait and then of course uh terry you pray for terry she's struggling right now she got to be in two places at once and that's not possible and uh, she's still got the mom heart and i'm with her on that i mean mckenzie's <laughs> battling hannah's battling and uh, it's just a it's just the devil battling against us i think you know but pray about that and i have no idea where barbara's at and uh, we're a little concerned about her right now she's not feeling well her body's hurting real bad she's been working trying to work and uh, if god doesn't intervene in the next two weeks she's going to move into a new place to live and we just got her settled so just pray for her and uh it's just a battle and uh, it's just a lot that we haven't even been able to really get settled down and so I don't know where she's at tonight. Terry tried to reach out to her. Um, and so that's a little concerning because last night she was hurting so bad she was going to go to the hospital and decided not to. She worked yesterday in the hospital. She was going to go there. And uh, I guess they were pretty busy, so she decided not to. But this morning when she came in, she was crying and said she was in a lot of pain. Is that right? And so uh, just pray for her. I don't know, you know physically, physically, she's just... Uh, in all, all honesty, she's probably one major hospital stay away from really going downhill without Don here and all that. It's just a lot, and that takes on your physical side of things. So we don't want to take that for granted that she's still <coughs> in that position to pray for her. Pray for us all, man. We are just yeah. battling to, to keep going, but I believe God's going to meet with us. And uh, that is that. I want to give. Uh, we need to keep praying for our nation. Pray for Israel. Pray for Hannah's surgery tomorrow. Pray for Mackenzie. Uh, pray for one another, amen. There's a lot of things we need to pray for, and uh, Lord willing, we'll be right back here Thursday night, amen. Uh, the only thing that will keep us from being able to do that is I can't be in two places at once either. If we get stuck, and we pray against that all the time, if we get stuck. Uh, if they, what I try to do, if they're going to let her go on Thursday and they push to the end of the day, I'll say, Can you just do it Friday morning? That way we can get down here at church and then I can go back and pick them up Friday morning. It's just better, and sometimes they'll work with us on that, but uh. I'm hoping she's out of the hospital by Thursday morning because that means everything went well, you know. So that's kind of how we're going to play it. Amen. I don't see any reason why she wouldn't be. Uh, it's going to depend on her. I think they're going to see how she's she, now. She hasn't ate food. What are we talking? Ten weeks now, Hannah? Has it been ten weeks since you ate food? It was right before Papa died, wasn't it? So eight, ten weeks, something like that. She hasn't ate any food, and so that's going to be part of this whole thing. You've got to see, you know. <laughs> So pray about all that, all right? Amen. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Well, uh, Chris, come on up here, son, and just put this in the plate, and uh, we'll we'll just not pass the plate tonight. If anybody has an offering, you just put it there, and uh, amen, and we'll go forward in that. And let me have a word of prayer, and then right after I pray, we'll stand together and sing a couple of congregationals, a cappella. Boy, I'm telling you, I sure, sure hate not having our piano player. And uh, we just don't want to take that for granted. I mean, I pastored for almost three years without a piano. And uh, in those days, we thought, man, this is hard. And now we've been so blessed to have the accompaniment. But uh, it is missed when it's gone. Amen. So we're not primitive Baptists. I yeah, promise amen. you that. We're not Church of Christ. Amen. We just, uh, we're down on. Amen. And uh, so pray for that. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time we had this morning. Uh, Lord, I need your help. My voice is about gone tonight, and I pray you'd help me to preach just for a little bit. 
and uh, get this message across to us tonight that we might glean from it as we continue on with the series. Bless the singing, the congregational singing that we're about to do. Help us to lift our voices in praise. I pray for Barbara. I don't know where she's at, what's going on with her. I pray for Mackenzie. God, touch her body while we're away from her. And then I pray for Hannah, God, that we would have a, a, a good surgery tomorrow, Lord, to touch her body. I know she's nervous. And uh, we're nervous for her. That's just natural. Not worried, but God nervous and apprehensive. I, I pray for the doctors. You'd steady their hands. And uh, Dr. Magison, Lord, give him what he needs, Lord, to, to do this right and to help him and to heal from it and to recover. May it be an effective surgery. Uh, and Lord, take us to the next step of healing. Bless our service as we try tonight just to obey you as we've assembled here. And bless everything that we say and do. Please, God, be with Israel. Uh, stand with them. God, protect them. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And pray for our nation as well. God, help yes. us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and turn to page number 87. Page number 87. Jesus loves me. Amen. Page 87. <clears throat> Cassidy, I want you to sing it out. You know this song, don't you? <laughs> Page 87, on the first. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Full of Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He who died, heaven's gates to open wide, he will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Holy, 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 
shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God Praise the Lord. Well, I appreciate the good singing tonight and doing the best we can. Amen. That's, he doesn't uh, ask us uh, for any type of ability other right. than availability. Amen. Amen. So we'll make ourselves available to him tonight. Let's take our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 tonight. Uh, Matthew chapter number 5. And uh, thank the Lord for the series we're in Amen. tonight. Was, uh, honestly, uh, I struggled difficultly this week trying to get all this put together. It, not because it's so long and hard, but because it is so simple. And, uh, it's almost shallow, but it is in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. And so we're trying to preach. Uh, it might feel more like a devotion, and, uh, but that's okay. And man, it's something we need to work on for sure. Matthew chapter 5, we're in verse number 33. Verse number 33 through 37, the next section here on the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says, Jesus speaking here, and he said this again. You know, we, we heard last week, he said in verse 31, it hath been said, and he dealt with divorce. Right now in verse 33, he said again, ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. And that is true. But he takes it up a notch and he said, But this I say unto you, swear not at all. Excuse me, swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. For whatsoever is uh, more than these cometh of evil. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for this time. Thank you for the word of God. I pray that you would help us, God, as we glean from your word tonight. I know that, Lord, it is different, Lord, tonight with that in mind on people that are not here. And, uh, Lord, I pray you'd help us to focus for just a little bit and uh, for the next few minutes to get some help from your word. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. amen. And amen. You may be seated tonight. Well, praise the Lord. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount has been a great help and a blessing. So we'll take this next little section here. And uh, we're dealing in a series here, you know, on uh, the requirements of a true disciple. This is message number 17 in the series. And uh, last week, the requirements of a true disciple, we dealt with uh, holding to a biblical position on divorce. Amen. Remember that? Amen. And in order to hold a biblical position on divorce, we need to have a biblical understanding of marriage. And so we looked at that. How all through the Sermon on the Mount, all through uh, this particular message to the disciples, we see Jesus, uh, he's reminding them of the law every time. And now that in this section he's going through, Amen. and he's reminding them of parts of the law, but he's reminding them that he takes the standard a little bit higher. And so here he again is dealing with communication, no doubt. And so I believe it would be a simple thought, but I believe tonight what we're dealing with, the requirements of a true disciple, it is that we keep our word. Keep Amen. our word. We're to be uh, people, obviously, as disciples, right. that uh, would be people of in, uh, integrity, people of character, people Amen. that are... Uh, 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 you've heard the saying, that person is a man of the word. In other words, if they say it, it's as good as done. Right. And, uh, there's not very many people that fall into that category anymore. I, I believe my pastor is a man of hey. his word. If he tells you he's going to do something, I promise you he'll go backwards and bend over and turn upside down to make sure that he gets it done. Even so much to the point that uh, if he verbally commits uh, or makes a commitment to missionaries, I'm, I know this for a fact, and uh, to support them for a certain amount of money every month, and all of a sudden the church all of a sudden uh, agrees and then something happens and maybe everybody loses their job my pastor will go get three jobs to make sure he doesn't have to back up on his word that's just the kind of man 
that he is. And I know there's good men like that. I'll be honest with you, I want to be the type of man, if I tell you I'm going to do something, I want to follow through. I have always been that way. No, we, 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 we have uh, times where things are beyond our control. We need to be careful. And the Bible has much to say in this particular uh, few verses about that. And so I want to look at that for just a little bit. It won't be, uh, it's not very deep, not very long, but it's something we need, amen. And so the requirements of a true disciple is that we keep your keep your word, amen. Uh, what you say, you need to do. And so Jesus says this, he said, uh, he said, uh, you've heard this, thou shalt not forswear, thy, forswear thyself, but shalt perform the Lord thine oath. And that is true. Uh, that is having to do with keeping your, your word. And I'll show you some verses here in a minute uh, that, that reiterate that over and over, primarily in the Old Testament. That is a principle. And uh, it is a fact. It is still right. Uh, but he takes it a little further. And he said, but I say to you, verse 34, uh, swear not at all. Don't swear. And uh, he's not talking about cursing. He's literally talking about swearing or committing an oath. Uh, right. If you remember when we were way, way back, maybe even a year ago, I don't remember how far back it was, we were in our series in Proverbs, how we talk about uh, he that is surety ship uh, for a friend is not wise. You know, we're talking about basically a cosigner and that type of uh, thing or, or a promissory note, if you will. And uh, the Lord is teaching in that principle that we're not even to do that. We're supposed to be such people of our word that our word should be enough. And uh, if we say we're going to do something, we shouldn't have to put it on a piece of paper and say, I'm going to do this. Um, and that's what he's trying. I think I believe that's the principle he's trying home is it don't swear. You should not have to swear. If your word is right, you shouldn't have to prove your word by, by well, I swear I'm going to do this. Well, wait a minute. If he says you're going to do it, do it. And that'll be enough of a testimony that when you do say something, that it's credible. And people say, again, about you and I, they are people of the word. And so that's what he's driving home here. He said, he said, uh, thou, uh, he says, swear not at all. And then he goes further, and here's why. And I think people do that. You've heard somebody say this, and I'm not being vulgar. I'm just, I'm telling you. Somebody will say, well, I swear to God, and then they fill in the blank. That's a sin. Don't ever do that. I, it's just, and this is part of the reason why. But he said, he said, don't swear by heaven. I, okay, that's like somebody saying, I swear by the heavens above that I'm going to, well, wait a minute, that's not supposed to happen. I, that's almost right. like to say, what it is when somebody says, I swear by heaven, or he said this, he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, uh, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by earth. I swear to the earth. I swear by the power of earth. He's, I'm giving you the examples of what he's talking about. He said, neither by the earth for his footstool, neither by Jerusalem. Now, we wouldn't do that, but the Jews might have. I swear by Jerusalem. I swear by the power of Jerusalem. You know, that's the kingdom. And uh, maybe that would be how they would approach that. Uh, or I, I, I swear uh, by my own head. I swear by my head. Uh, or I, I, uh, and that's what they're saying. And so you understand the principle that he's teaching there. These things, you don't have the authority. Just when you, it's almost like saying, I swear to this degree of authority. But the problem is we don't have that authority. We do not own heaven. We don't own the earth. This earth is the Lord's footstool. He said that. Heaven is not ours. Amen. And we're not ours. I mean, we can go as far as say, well, okay, I'm not swearing by what is God's. I'm not swearing what belongs to the Lord. I'm swearing by me. And he said, you don't even belong to yourself. You can't make your hair white or black. In other words, you're not in control. So for you to say, I swear by, then you put that as the authority or the the um the, the the guarantee of your your oath that swearing is not a a cursing it is making an oath amen right. it's making a promise if you will when you swear i had to do this not long ago um i had to go to a deposition for the uh the situation that we're dealing with uh, i wish i could say more about that right now but uh but i mean you know what i had to do I had, there was a there was me there was my attorney there was the the plaintiff amen and uh, and his attorney and there was a uh, 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 what you call a neutral biased 
court reporter. They have to have that because anytime you go into a legal, uh, if you've never done it, uh, in that setting, a deposition is a legal binding. Everything is a record. And so the court appoints, they have people that are like a third party. They work for the court systems. They don't have a, a, a dog in the fight. They have to be neutral. And they come in and uh, when the plaintiff orders uh, for a deposition, it, their responsibility to hire the third party, which again has no dog in the fight, all they simply do is record the entire deposition and everything, every question that's asked, how it is asked, how it is answered, how it is, re uh, if you refuse to answer, they'll say non-responsive or whatever. They have to type all that and not only that, they record, they audibly record that. Why? Because that now becomes legal evidence in a case. You understand that? Well, do you know the first thing that, that is asked whenever you go in there? Uh, the court reporter, she comes on the record and she said, this is such and such. And so far I have everyone, she names everybody in the room and everybody in the room has to state their name. And then the, these are all here. We are officially on the record at this date and on this time. Now we will ask the defendant. Now I'm the defendant in this particular case. Mr. So-and-so, uh, uh, do you, uh, would you raise your right hand? Now this is the truth now. Would you raise your right hand? Yes, ma'am. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And the answer is, I do. And that is still a part of the legal system. And uh, that is a, that's an oath. I took I, that's what they say. The perjury is a penalty for lying under oath. That takes a lot of weight, does it not? Where do we draw that from? Well, we draw that from our Judeo law system. And so I, I didn't mean to get into all that, but that is uh, the weight that an oath carries. It is under an oath. I do solemnly swear. Do he stand? You you don't, don't swear. Amen. You don't need to do that because what you're saying is uh, you think that you have more of a binding or more of a uh, a um, a guaranteeing to the, the what you've said, the oath you've committed, if you will, by swearing by heaven or by earth or by some other authority that's not yours. You think that gives you some weight to what you're saying. And Jesus is basically teaching his disciples here, no, that's not what gives you the way. I know that there's, again, this is, I could have gone really deep with this or really simple. I just didn't know. Really, we don't want to overkill this. I mean, I don't think we have a, a problem understanding the context. It's just how do we apply it? And I think we can do that. But, but Jesus is driving home to his disciples. You're not like the rest of the world. The rest of the world, that's how they live their life because they have no character. They have no integrity. They swear all the time and they never follow through. And so even though they may swear by God, they may swear by heaven or by earth, they may swear by the kingdom of Jerusalem, they still don't follow through. Right. And not only does that bring insult to their testimony, now you bring a reproach to the Lord because he's God. You're saying basically that God is going to make sure I keep my promise. And when you don't keep your promise, who's getting the blame? Who's getting the fault here? You understand? Who's right. getting a bad testimony? The Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we're not talking about uh, that's how carnal Christians will. Uh, and that's not how the world, uh, they operate that way. But my disciples are not supposed to be like the rest of the world. My disciples are supposed to be different than that. They're supposed to have something about them that draws people to me. Remember uh, earlier on? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work. Can we just go ahead and apply that here? Let your, your, your word, your word, your vow, let it be so real and so valid and so solid that people will see that you're a man or a woman of your word and therefore they will glorify God. That's what he's trying to get home. Okay? Good night. You're dismissed. No, I'm not. I'm going to give you a little more than that. But I mean, that is the gist of the context. He said this. Here's it. He said, in fact, don't, don't do this. So he gives us a couple verses on what not to do. Right. But here's the key. Here's what he's driving home to the disciples. Look at verse um, verse number 37 again. He said, but, in other words, don't do this. I know that you've heard this. This is the law. And he did not deny that's the law, did he? No. no. He, he said, you've well heard. He said, that is the law. He's quoting from the law. And he knows that's what they know. And he's, he's bringing the law into this because that's where they communicate. But then he takes it a little bit further. He said, don't do this. Now he says, do this. Don't you love the word of God? He said, here's what you know. That's a good thing. Here's what you don't need to do. And here's what you do. And then in verse 37, he said, but 
Let your communication, he said, just as clear as he can, as straight as he can, let your communication be like this. This is how you need to communicate about it. And now we know the context. He's talking about what? Vows. He's talking about his oaths. He will. He's talking about our word. Does that make sense? I don't know a better terminology or vernacular to explain that. We understand the terminology when somebody says, Brother James Brown is a man of his word. If he says he's going to do it, he's going to get it done. Hey, man, we need people like that. We need people like that in the church, hey, amen. If they tell the pastor they're going to get something done, I remember uh, being a director of operations at Chick-fil-A, and, uh, man, there's some people I had to go on and micromanage them. I didn't like that. I have 200 and something, 250 something plus employees underneath me, and if I gave somebody a job to do, and they said to me, yes, sir, I understand that, that lets me know they're going to do their job. Right. And if I go and I just go ahead and trust them on do their job, guess what? It better be done. Well, what if it's not done? Now, I'm going to answer for that, see, because I'm the one been get, given the responsibility to delegate what needs to get done to the people that are underneath me. And if their word is not good, I have to go check up on them. Guess what I'm going to do? Rather than let my head be on the chopping block, you know what I would do, Brother James? I'd go do what I told them to do, and they said they would do in the first place before they were worried about it. They don't care. My boss did not care how it got done. They just wanted it done. And if I tell somebody to do something, and they say, I'll get it done. And I, I found out those that I could give responsibility. Let me tell you how it works. The same thing is true in the kingdom of God. The same thing is true in God's word. When we find people that actually keep their word, that's why the Bible says, uh, he who is faithful and little will be given much. Is that not what he said? And, right. and, and, and to whom much is given, much shall be required. What is that all about? What that has to do with, if I give you a little small task to do, and I find out that you are a man of the word, and you keep your word and tell me you'll get it done, and it actually gets done, I'm going to put more on you because I know I can trust your word. And that's the way it works here. Uh, and we're more trustworthy for the things of God. He said, let your communication be, let it be yay, yay, nay, nay. That's just it. Boy, that's, if that's the entire message that he's driving home to these disciples is, you just basically, you need to say what you mean and mean what you say. That's what he's saying. It, it needs to be yay, yay. If you say yes about doing something, then that's it. You don't need to swear by anything. You don't need any peace. You, you need to just say, okay, I'll do it, and then get it done. Or if you say no, don't change your mind. In other words, don't be wishy-washy. Right. I grew up here and that. I, you don't hear that much anymore. And uh, in fact, I heard that my whole life and went years and years and years and never heard it until uh, brother uh, brother Johnny Pope came to preach at a youth meeting a message called This is No Time to Go Wobbly. And he preached it just like that. No time to go wobbly on the shaft. And uh, he brought out, he said, you don't need to be wishy-washy. And uh, that's what he's talking about. And, and that's the way Jesus is teaching them. Let your communication basically... Don't do it like this. Do it like this. Yay! Yay! If I say yes, that means yes. Amen. If I say no, that means no. He said this. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Mm -hmm. If your yes doesn't mean yes, and your no doesn't mean no, then it's of evil. Right. It's of evil. It's going to bring reproach to you. Your testimony It's going to bring reproach to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to bring reproach to the church. It's going to be a reproach to your job, whatever the case is. I imagine, Brother James, if your boss uh, asked you to do something, you said you would do it, and he goes back and finds out you didn't do it, you probably wouldn't have a boss much longer. Amen. He'd have one more word for you. You're fired. And, and that, right, that's true of all of us. And, uh, you know, these men that support us uh, to do what we're doing here, if I told them, oh, yeah, we're preaching the book, and uh, we're singing the right songs, uh, we're still knocking some doors, we're still trying to reach people, we go to the hospitals, we do this, we do that, and, and then they come out here, we're doing none of that. Well, I just lost my testimony. I brought reproach on me. I brought reproach on my family. I brought reproach on the Harvest Baptist Church. I brought reproach on my pastor. I brought reproach on Macedonia World Baptist Missions and any other pastor that is behind us. You see what he's saying? He said, let your communication be clear. Yay, yay, and nay, nay. Now, here's the message, and I'm going to be done. Notice about three things here about this particular passage of Scripture. Number one, I want you to notice the instructions. God's Word gives us instructions. Notice the instructions about keeping your word. He started with that, did he not? He said, you have heard that it hath been said of them of old time. So now we're going to talk about what has been said. 
That's the instruction. He said, you've heard that it's been said. Well, here's the instruction that has been given about our word. Now, this is not everything. Y'all understand? I'm just giving you a thumbnail. I could probably pull out 30 or 40 verses. I don't think that's necessary for this particular. I know it's a small principle. It's important. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. Y'all know that. And this is important. And Christopher, was it just a couple of weeks ago? He preached on the tongue, that little member. And so it's important that uh, when it comes to not only how we communicate, that's not the message. What he's talking about is when we give our word that we're going to do something. You know, I, I, I'll give you an example. As a boy, uh, my dad would often call. It wasn't often, I should say better than that. But when he would call, he would often say, uh, I'm going to come see you. And he lived in Missouri at that time, and I lived in the Panhandle, Texas. And he'd call me up. And uh, if I got to the phone and got to talk to him, most of the time my mom wouldn't even let me talk to him because he was a liar. But he would say something like this. I'm going to come see you, bud. Oh, man, I was, you know, at that time as a child, I didn't see the evil in my father. You understand that? I just thought, well, that's great. And he'd tell me stuff. He said, I'm going to come see you uh, next weekend, and I'm going to take you shopping, and we'll get you some clothes, and, and I'm going to take you out to eat. You think about where you want to go eat. And all week long, you know what I was thinking about? I wasn't thinking about school. I wasn't thinking about, I was thinking about my dad's coming, and he's going to take me out to eat. I didn't care about none of that. I'm going to spend some time with my dad. And boy, man, Friday would roll around, and uh, he told me on the phone, he's going to be there Friday night. And uh, when I get off school, and he's going to pick me up, and he'll bring me back, and then Saturday he'll pick me up again. And we'll go spend the whole day, we'll go do something fun. Maybe we'll go to a carnival, whatever the case was. And he told me all these things. And uh, and Friday, about six, 5 o'clock, well, I guess 4 I'd be at home at 4 o'clock and I'm watching the clock and I'm pacing the house and uh, now my dad's probably running late he got to drive in you know and I'd be pacing the floor I'd get excited my mom would be getting mad uh, and then she'd start drinking because she got mad that's what she did I'm just telling you and I'd uh, I'd just say well okay 5 o'clock he's running late and in the fall time it'd be getting dark and I'd be like well I guess we can't go do that and then maybe he'll be here and we still go eat boy 7 o'clock I'm a kid I'm starving to death no I'm not going to eat they're going to eat my, my mom and my brother Really want to eat, you know, stepdad, they just want to eat. Now, I'm not going to eat right now because my dad's taking me out to eat. Boy, eight, nine, ten o'clock, roll around. I guess I'm hungry. You want something to eat? No, I don't want nothing to eat. Why not? Well, you know, my dad might show up. And then the conversation that I had so many times, my mom would say, I don't think he's coming. Well, okay, I'm going to go to bed. Maybe he'll be here in the morning. And I called my dad probably a dozen times and no answer. No answer. And mom wouldn't let me keep calling because back then it was long distance. We didn't have cell phones and stuff. Everything was long distance. I could call and collect, but uh, I couldn't call and collect when he wasn't there. And I'd call him. Nobody would answer. Saturday morning, I'd get up, man, as soon as the sun was up, I'd be dressed and ready to go. And I'd be, what are you doing? I'm waiting on my dad. He's coming today. Man, I don't know what happened, but he'll be here. Boy, half the day would go by Saturday. All day Saturday night. Boy, my dad ain't coming. You don't know what that does. Does I mean, I'm using that as a personal illustration. I know what that's like. Some of you might know what that is. I'm talking about, man, all my life. You know what I learned by the time I was a teenager? My dad's word doesn't mean nothing to me. And to this day, I'm 43 years old, I'm a 44. And you know, if my dad told me something, Brother James, I'm just going to be real honest with you, it don't mean nothing to me. You know why? Because his word is not valuable. It's not valuable. He, he's told me a lot of things he's going to do he ain't ever done. It. And so I just learned that can't trust his word. But boy, but there's been some people that uh, my granny and papa, they would call me up and say, hey, uh, next week, you want to come spend the night with granny and papa Saturday night? We'll take you to church on Sunday. And uh, Saturday night, we'll cook some hamburgers on the barbecue grill. And they tell me stuff like that. And Sunday, we'll take you, uh, we'll take you out to eat after church Sunday night. You want to come? Uh, yeah, and boy, man, I'm talking about Friday would come around, and Granny would pick me up from school. I, I'd just stay Friday and Saturday, and they'd pick me up from school. I mean, I counted the days down, and I was so excited. And you know something, uh, ever in my lifetime, if they ever told me they was going to do something, they did it. There's a lot of times they just didn't say nothing because they didn't want to break their promise. You know, I would try to get uh, people to make promises to me, and, and they won't do it. And I could give you, but you know, do you see what happens when we don't keep our word, what it's supposed to be? There's some instruction about that here in the Bible. And so he's, here's the instruction. He says, you've heard it said. Well, here's some of the instruction about keeping your word. The Bible says in Numbers chapter 30 and verse number 2, If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, notice what it says, he shall not break his word. 
You're supposed to keep your word. That's what we're talking about. He shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that uh, proceeded out of his mouth. If you make a vow, or of course the Lord's telling us not to make a swear, but to be clear in our communication. If you say you're going to do something, you need to say, you need to follow through. That's just a good thing. I know it's common sense, but one way, it's amazing that Jesus had to teach these disciples this. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 21 through 23, when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it. For the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. That reminds me of when the Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Basically, if you've said you're going to do something, and you've not kept your word, now it's sin. But if you just didn't say nothing, he said, if you forbear to vow, in other words, if you just don't, it'd be better for you just not to say you're going to do something than to do it and, not, and to say you're going to do it and not do it. Don't make a commitment that you can't keep. And that's what he's teaching here. He said, uh, he said, that which has gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform, even a free will offering, according as thou hast found the Lord. The reason he brings that up in that context. A free will offering is it's not required of the Lord. I mean, it's something I do of my own free will, right? But if I vow or I make a promise, hey, I'm going to, you know, preacher, sometimes uh, we'll be in a meeting and somebody say, I'll give 100 to that need and we'll go through the auditorium and man, uh, you know, maybe there's a $5,000 need for a building project in the church or whatever and we get the men or whoever, uh, anybody want to give to that? And somebody stands up, they don't, I don't have the money today, preacher, but uh, in the next week I'll have it, I'll give 100 towards that. All right, the preacher writes that down. Now that's a free will offering. He's not really bound to that. He doesn't have to do that. But if he made that commitment, he's to keep it, even if it's a free will offering. That's what he's saying. He said, according as thou hast vowed unto thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. You made a promise with your mouth. You need to keep it. And, uh, of course, here's what I like what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, in verse number 2. He said, be not rash with thy mouth. Don't be so quick to make promises. Don't be so quick, he said, be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thy heart be hasty to utter anything. Don't be saying things you're not going to do, he said, before God. He said, for God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. You better be careful about how fast you want to say things that come to your mind, uh, because uh, God's in heaven, he keeps perfect record, and you need to be a person that knows how to communicate what you say is what you'll do. What you say you won't do, you won't do. Amen. I, I, I'm very careful. I know this is probably a little bit of a stretch, maybe to some, but I've said through the years, I, I, I think as far as I'm standing here, as far as I can remember, I don't believe that I've ever said, I'll never compromise. I've never tried to say it that way. I've always tried to say, by the good grace of God, I will not compromise. I will not change the Bible that I preach. I will not. I've said, by the grace of God, because I'm hoping that God will help me not to do that, because I'm not above that. But what are you saying? I'm just trying to be real careful about being so dogmatic, because I've watched people say they'll never compromise, and they're out there today, and you can't find them with the FBI. He said, therefore, let thy words be few. And listen to what the Bible says, Jesus, over in Matthew 12. He said, but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Well, well how does that apply to here? Because if you are yea, yea, and nay, nay, I said I was going to do this, and I did it, that justifies me. I kept my word. But if I said something and didn't do it, you know what that does? That condemns me, because I'm already condemned by the fact I didn't keep my word. And we're talking about the requirements of the disciples that you keep your word. Of course, the Bible says in James chapter 5, and verse number 12, but above all things, my brethren, he reminds us what Jesus is teaching here, but above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay be nay. Now he goes a little further, lest you fall into condemnation. Now didn't Jesus just tell us in Matthew 12, was it, that I just quoted from, uh, that our words would be what can either justifies us or condemns us? And therefore, if we keep the word, if we communicate clearly, yeah, yeah, and nay, nay, that would be what that clears us. But if we don't, we're condemned by the very vows that we make and don't keep. Amen. Amen. Number one, I see the instruction. For keeping your word. Number two, I see the integrity 
we're learning, we're drawing some things, gleaning from some principles here. Not only the instruction for keeping your word, but I see in the integrity of keeping your word. Now, Jesus is teaching clearly by these verses. There's a principle he's teaching you need to be people of integrity. Let your yea be yea, nay be nay. I mean, that's, just, that's, that's integrity. And that's a word we don't use much anymore. People don't have much integrity. Uh, integrity is something that you just do regardless. I mean, if you make a promise to do something, uh, do it. Be, have some integrity about you uh, as a disciple. Let me look at the integrity of your word. Proverbs 11, 3 comes to mind. He said this, The integrity of the upright shall guide them. You know what will guide you to keep your word? If you're right with God, you'll have some integrity, and it'll be what convicts you. Your conviction, it'll compel you. Hey, wait, I said I'd do this. I need to do this. I said I would do this. I need to do this. I said I would not do that. I need to just not do that. I mean, oh, yeah, I said I wouldn't go there. I said I wouldn't do that. I, I forgot about that. I need to keep that. That that. If you're right with God, that integrity will be what guides you. That's not part of the Holy Ghost. It guides you. But it says that the integrity of the upright shall guide them. But listen, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. When you're perverted in your speech, in other words, you say one thing and mean another. Then that's going to be hey, that's going to be what brings destruction. It'll destroy you. I mean, I, I, I use my dad, and I'm not trying to throw shade on my dad. I'm just using a personal illustration of me. Here's the thing. My dad doesn't have the testimony today of a man of his word. Everybody calls him a liar. Everybody in the family says, oh, he's a liar. You can't believe anything he says. You know what that is? That's being destroyed by your perverse lips. Hey, amen? Do you want that kind of testimony? I don't want that kind of testimony. How, I hope it would not be said of God's people, man, when we're not around. Man, you better be careful what they say. You can't trust a word they say. Don't you know somebody like that? I know a lot of people like that. Well, you can't trust anything they say because that, that they've been destroyed by the perverseness of their lips. Their communication is not being clear. And so that is the integrity of our word. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse number 4, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not, don't hold back, don't you wait, don't hesitate. He said, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. In other words, when you make a, when you communicate yea, yea, nay, nay, when you're that clear, when you're making an oath or you're making a vow, he said, you need to understand, you need to get right to, be, get busy about doing what you said you do. Don't delay, don't delay. Well, I'll come and see you. Well, don't wait six months. If you don't, you're going to come do I'm using that. That's extreme, right? But don't delay. Don't defer. Don't hold back on getting it done because God has no pleasure in fools. You know what he's saying? You're a fool to say you're going to do something and not do it quickly. You're a fool to make a vow. You're a fool to commit your word to a cause and not quickly follow through. That's what he said. God has no Amen. pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. In other words, what you said you would do, get it done. Get it done. Preacher, I'm going to mow the grass. Well, you didn't say you going to mow it in six months when it's already dead. I mean, you know, there's people like that. Oh, preacher, I'll mow the grass. Okay. Five months later, man, the grass is so high, we'll get a jungle out here. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get around to that. I told you I would. No, listen, y'all know. Hey, I'm going to mow the grass. All right, next week I'm expecting the grass to be cut. You didn't tell me what day, but that's not, that's how valid, that's how valuable and how credible our word needs to be. It shouldn't even be like, well, I'm going to mow the grass on such and such day. Now, there may be a time you have to schedule certain things you vow, but it ought to be that we carry such credibility as disciples. Hey, hey, Chris, I, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to paint your room. Well, he ought to come home and room paint. I mean, I'm just throwing stuff. I ain't painting the room. I just want you to know. I'm just giving Amen. illustrations here tonight. Amen. So I see. I know it's simple. I see the instructions. The instructions about keeping your word. I see the integrity of keeping your word. And then lastly, just from these three or four little verses, I see also something. I'm drawing some principles. I hope you're getting that. I'm drawing some principles from here that I believe I'm going to try to drive home. I say I see the importance mm. of keeping your word. Do you think it's important to keep your word? Mm. Well, can I say this? If it wasn't important, do you think the Lord would have put it in this particular passage of Scripture? Right. He wouldn't have put it anywhere in the Bible for that matter. But he not only did he put it in the Word of God, he put it right here in the Sermon on the Mount Amen. to the disciples. It's very important. What is the importance of keeping your Word? Well, I would say this. It's important to keep your Word that you... Well, let's read what the Bible says in Matthew 15, verse 11. The Bible says, 
not that which go with, and the reason there's this conversation, you know the context, they're trying to trip Jesus up because they the, the disciples were eating with unwashed hands. They didn't wash their hands. And the Lord has to teach them a lesson here. He said, that ain't what defiles a man. He, so here's what he said. Not that which go within the mouth defileth the man. That's not what defileth the man. And he said, that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. It's not what goes in that defiles the man, but it's what comes out that defiles the man. Matthew 15, 11. You know what I, I say about that? Well, let me give you another one. But further on in that same chapter, in verse 18 through 20, here's what he said. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts. Notice what he said. False witness. Mm -hmm. Blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. You say, preacher, what is the importance of keeping your word? Well, there's a lot of things that are important, but I think the most important thing about keeping our word, what the Lord trying to teach his disciples, you know what the most important thing? That we don't defile our testimony. Because again, it goes back to you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. Wait a minute. If you're defiled, you know what you've done? You put a bushel over the light. Right. Did you right. not? You took the saber out of the salt, right? <laughs> it's all right in the context. He said, the importance of you and I keeping our word is that we not be defiled. Not only that, if we get defiled, doesn't that mean probably that we're going to defile other people? Absolutely. Many right. thereby be defiled. If you go read in Hebrews, talking about root of bitterness. Mm -hmm. He said, lest any root of bitterness spring it up. And it says, and many thereby be defiled. Or many be defiled thereby. By whose bitterness? By my bitterness. Well, if that principle, we know the context, dealing with bitterness. But if that is true, if my bitterness can cause other people to be defiled that are in my life looking at me and watching me, don't you think that if I don't keep my word, obviously that which comes out of my mouth defiles the man. What do you mean? Well, if a man says yea, but he does nay, or he says nay and he does yea, does that make sense? Let me keep right. it biblical here. If that happens, then that defiles the man because out of the heart. Out of the heart comes false witness. False witness? Yeah. Making a promise, making a vow, and not keeping it. See, not keeping your word. The importance of keeping your word is simply that we keep ourselves from defilement. Mm -hmm. Amen. Here's the, here's the bottom line. This, this evening, I know is, is, is so simple, but you know what? We live in a generation. I hope there's nobody in here that struggles with that. Some of you youngins, you still got to go down that road of having to make promises and keep. Mm -hmm. I understand that, and this will be a help to you. The rest of us are in our adult life; we ought to have this down, but we still need to be reminded. But I'm going to tell you something: if we're going to be true disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's required that we keep our word. It is right. required that right. we keep our word. Communicate simply: yay, yay. My yay means yay. Right. My nay means nay. If I say yes, that means yes. If I say no, that means no. Shouldn't be in between us. Maybe he's not in there. He didn't say maybe. No, maybe he's the guy that rides the fence. Maybe he's the wishy-washy one. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. That's what we tell our kids when we don't want to give them a definite answer, right? No, it's when we don't want to. It's what we don't want to vow. But 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 right here he's talking about when we make that commitment, we make that communication. It'll be yay yay and nay nay. And here's here's the verse that I think really ties it all together. And I'm done. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 5. Now John is the beloved. Amen. And here's what he said. But whoso keepeth... Man, you couldn't put this together better. But whoso keepeth his word. Now we're talking about disciples keeping their word. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Amen. He said, hereby. Hereby? Yeah, by what? By this here. In other words... By the fact that he keeps his word, hereby we know that we are in him. You know what, can I just, without hurting the scripture, a man keeps his word, we know he's a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hereby we know that we're disciples because we keep his word. We, we keep his word, we keep our word. He said, whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. That's what manifests the love of God. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, what's the point of being a disciple? The entire, the underlying point, the entire purpose of us being disciples is that we can reach the lost and dying world. With what? With the love of Christ. Right. Right. And the love of Christ is perfected. The love of God is perfected in our lives as disciples as we keep our word. As we keep our word. The requirements of a true disciple is that we keep our word. 
Amen. Church, let's be people of our word. When we Amen. say yay, let's mean yay. When we say nay, let's mean nay. So that anybody at any time lost or saved could look at our lives and say, you know what? I don't know much about them, but I'll tell you something. That's a person that keeps their word. And they might just by that say, I believe they're believers. I believe they are those that are Christian. I believe they belong to God Amen. because they're people that keep their word. Let's stand together. Father, tonight, thank you for the word of God. I know it's been simple and it's been short, but God, tonight, we're just trying to give this. I don't want to take off more and do injustice to the next part of Scripture, so tonight we'll just take this. And God is a nugget.